Just me. Ja, okej. Okay. Oh, Renee. Hi, Renee. So on my computer, I don't see her name. I see yours. So far, I just there's four people on, but I just see oh. Renee and I. All right, it is seven o'clock. Hope everyone had a good day today. My mom's on. Mom's on. Renee and Lyle. It was 62 here in Burlington, Iowa today. I want to say hello to, hopefully, uh, if you see the names Jackie Kissler and uh, Bear Kissler, Jackie is not doing well, so we want to pray for her. She's in the hospital with congestive heart issues, so keep them in your prayers. John and hello, John and Catherine. Let's see who else comes on here tonight. John and hello. All right. Well, show of hands. How many read through Romans 8 this week? Mine keeps saying waiting for a signal. Is it cutting out on your end at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Maybe it's just my computer slow. Is slow. Well, you can see why many people say that Romans 8, this section, is their favorite part of the whole Bible or their favorite part of Romans. Um, as, as we've been going through it, you can see why. A lot of great, rich truths. Mine's, so it, mine's been interrupted. Is everybody else? So let us know. Uh, Pam and I are just having on our end the service being interrupted. Is it? Is there a glitch or anything tonight out there? So give us a thumbs up if everything's okay. I haven't seen any internet problems lately, have you? Mm -hmm. Since we got a new router, they fixed a couple cables. Uh, we got a new router. Ours was ancient, so... Nobody's giving a thumbs up, which is worrisome. Yeah, it just did it again, didn't it? Mm-hmm. All right, everybody that's on tonight, can you give us a thumbs up if your computer's okay? Or have you had, let us know if there's been any glitches. So it, Catherine said it cut out here a couple of times. Okay. A little bit, but everything just cleared up, Renee. Okay. Good deal. Okay. All right, well, shall we... Uh, Judy Hausner's on now. Judy Hausner's on? Mm-hmm. All right, hi, Judy and Bill. Let's see who else comes on here. Thumbs up, I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Seems better on mine, too. Judy says... Oh, uh, now it just interrupted, but it came back. Okay. Mom said she's having some problems going in and out. Hmm. Lyle said just went fuzzy. Just went fuzzy. All right, well, let's give it a second. I can't think of anything else that would be on in our house. Can you? Mm -mm. And we, you have, you've have, you been on the computer probably all day, haven't you? Mm -hmm. And no problems? No problems. I've been on the run all day. Church. Met with some other pastors. We're working on a Christmas float. Uh, just different things, so. Lyle said cleared. I haven't been on the computer at all, which is... <clears throat> Jackie, hello, Jackie. I send me your number, Jackie. I tried to call Bear today, and I do not have your number. I was calling to see how you were doing, so that's good to see you on and know that you're on our prayer list as well. Thanks a lot. I'm kind of jerky when I move. <laughs> Maybe tell everybody again about Jackie so they can pray for. Her. Yeah, just pray for Jackie Kissler, who's on here uh, every week. Um, they live in Council Bluffs, and uh, we got a prayer request that she uh, was having con uh, congestive heart issues. Jackie, if that's uh, sorry to hear that, we'll definitely keep you in, in our prayers. And um, yeah, please let us know. Uh, Pam, do you have her number on your phone? I know when you guys move, you change phones. And um, yeah, anyway, we'll, after this, we'll try and get back in touch with you. 
but glad to see you on tonight. That's that's a good good thing. So let's begin in prayer and we will jump back into Romans 8. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word, how precious it is to us, how just this passage is so amazingly uh, deep, uh, but yet anyone that's on tonight can grasp these amazing truths. We'll never be able to plummet the depths of what's being taught here. Uh, we look forward throughout eternity learning more about uh, your grace and mercy in our lives, but uh, help us again tonight as we finish out this chapter to to really see how great our salvation really is, all that you've accomplished to bring us to yourself. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Paul has no doubt let us know that we do have sufferings in this world. And uh, we long for that day, according to chapter 8, to where we have a final redemption of our body. That's verse 23. Uh, but until then, we're going to groan. The whole creation groans, and we ourselves groan. And yet we look forward to that day when creation itself will be set free. And we will get our final down payment, if you will, our final completion, our final stage in salvation, which is a glorified, resurrected body. That's where we're headed. So in this world right now... Uh, we're going to encounter hardships and trials, yet God, as we saw a couple weeks ago, we looked at it again last week, uh, we have confidence that God um, causes all things to work together uh, for good. This is verse 28. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So if you're a believer, God has called you to himself. At one time you were spiritually dead, alienated, enemies of God. Um, we saw in chapter 8, those who do not have the Spirit, they cannot please God. Uh, that's chapter 8, verse 8. We were in that state. We were just in the flesh at one time. No thoughts of God. Like uh, Romans 3 talks about, uh, there's none who do good. Not even one. There's none righteous. There's not even one. Um, everyone needs to be reconciled. And uh, we're seeing in chapter 8, now that we are believers by God's foreknowledge, his covenant love, his predestination, his justification, we saw last week that he's, it's as good as done. We are going to be glorified. So let's take a look at verse 29 and 4. So verse 28 and then verse 29, 4, and this is just giving more proof that God is for us. Right, God is working in our lives. And we said we can see many beautiful things that have happened in our lives. We can recognize the beauty in nature and friendships and family and a new birth of a baby. But yet there's a lot of hardships and even things that we can't explain what God is doing. Sometimes years down the road we can look back. But ultimately we have to trust God in what he's doing, what he's working out. Because he's conforming us into what? The image, of his the image of his son. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So that he, Jesus, would be preeminent among his brethren. That word firstborn in the Old Testament, I could do a whole sermon on that, is the idea of preeminence. Firstborn had all these rights in, in the Old Testament. It comes to have the idea of preeminence. And uh, so here, God is working in our lives so that Jesus, and conforming us to the image of Jesus so that he would have preeminence among all of the redeemed. Then he gets into what we call last week the golden chain of redemption. And I, like I said, I've had this chain for a long time. Uh, each link representing what we see here, those whom he foreknew, those he pre, uh, predestined, right, etc. So you have foreknowledge, predestination, calling, that internal calling by God's Spirit, calling us to salvation, this, this drawing, this opening up our eyes, this uh, word of God being spoken that actually brings about what it is intended to do. 
So those who he called, he what? Justified. Justified. We've seen that theme throughout Romans. We've talked a lot about that. And those whom he justified, he also, same tense as these others, glorified. Yet according to chapter 8, verse 23, it hasn't happened yet. Pam does not have a uh, glorified body. She, her back aches, she says today. My back aches today. How many of you online could, could complain about how your body is breaking down? Somebody just recently told me, now I've got floaters in my eyes. This is great. This, this old age is for the birds. You know, my, my shoulder's out, my back's given out, and uh, our bodies are what? Wearing down. They're gro groaning. We are eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies. And yet, according to verse 30, it's as good as done. Those whom he justified, he glorified. Even though it's, not, it, it's past tense, why is it that way? Because it's as good as done. Now, I hope this brings you a lot of comfort in reading this section. It, that's what it should do. If, if God is doing all of these things, what should be our response? Praise. Praise, gratitude, thanksgiving, joy. And it doesn't mean that all, all the time, maybe tonight, you've had just a, a rough day, a terrible day. And you're like, you know, Kendall, I just, I got a stinky attitude tonight. I know I should be more happy about these things. We all, we've all been there and understand that, right? But deep down, so we're not talking about, we have to put on a smile, just act like everything's okay. But deep down inside, we know that God is working. He's got me. He's gonna. He's gonna continue. He's gonna bring me home. That's encouraging. And uh, now, this is what I want to get to this week. So we we went all through all that last week. What shall we say to these things? How often do you contemplate or slow down and meditate on things? Not enough. Not enough. Just slowing down. Uh, I don't have them written down, but many times the psalmist will, will say, I, I was meditating on my bed, right? I'm meditating on your word as I go to bed at night. Meditation takes time to just slow down and think about something. Ponder it. Have you pondered these great truths? How should these truths stir our affections for God? Which also creates gratitude. We're coming up to Thanksgiving. But for believers, Thanksgiving is, right, 24-7, right, 365 days of the year. Yeah, we recognize that uh, our founding fathers, what, wanted to set apart a, a certain day for our country to give thanks. We understand that. It's a great holiday, right? It's a biblical holiday, if you will. So what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? Do you like rhetorical questions? Sometimes. Yeah. Makes you think. Yeah. Did you, we'd ask our kids, um, a lot of times we'd ask kids rhetorical questions even though we knew the answer, right? Like who, who broke that lamp? Maybe we, we knew who broke the lamp. We want acknowledgement. It's uh, sometimes rhetorical questions you ask, even though you know the answer, the, the answer is implied or the answer is obvious, right? And Paul, I think, is doing it to stir up our appreciation, our affection, our contemplation, if you will, on what has just now been said. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? And you might say a lot of people could be against you, right? You could have enemies, as we're going to see. It, just because it says, if God is for us, who's against us? Ultimately, they can't be against you. Ultimately, they can't separate you from the love of God, as we're going to see. So, <clears throat> definitely the writer and the whole Bible understands that you could have a government against you, Right? You could have people that actually want you dead and actually accomplish that. They could assassinate you, right? They could throw you in prison like many Christians in other countries for the last 2,000 years have been brought up on false charges in a communist country, right? 
you're against the state or you spoke evil against the state and uh, we're going to lock you in prison or we found you with a Bible in North Korea. Uh, they, you know, you get caught praying or you're with a Bible and you're like, that's unjust. Right? Would that be unjust? Mm -hmm. So what does it mean that if God is for us, who's against us? If God is for us, don't be thinking you're going to live in a bubble and you're just going to be protected and everything's going to be okay. Is that how you read it? No. Uh, well, I mean, I have learned through the years that that's not what it means. Right. In an ultimate sense, can anybody separate you from what God has predestined for to occur for you? Will you be glorified one day? Mm -hmm. Is he doing, is, did God foreknow, set his covenant love upon you, predestinate you, call you savingly to himself? Did he justify you? then he is going to glorify you. Can anybody break that chain, if you will? Can anybody break that bond? Can anybody break the love that God has set upon you to bring you fully to himself? And the answer is no. That's not going to happen. <clears throat> now, when we experience tough things, should we be reminding ourselves of these truths? And the answer is, of course. He who did not spare his own son what does that bring out uh, any thoughts that phrase he gave his most precious gift who did spare their own son in the bible well isaac was spared isaac do you think this could be hinting at he who did not spare his own son god spared abraham's son by providing a sacrifice the lord if you remember abraham said the lord will provide Isaac says, Dad, you know, where, where's, where's, the, where's the sacrifice? Lord, Lord's going to provide. And he provided. So Abraham's son was spared. But here it says, he did not spare his own son. He who did not spare his own son delivered him over. Think about this language that's being used. Think about Christmas. We're getting ready to celebrate the first advent. The Messiah coming into the world, right? To do what? Be on a saving mission. Uh, Paul in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16 says, says something like this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He, so here, God the Father hands him over, del delivered him over for us all. He who did not spare his own son. The question is, could he have spared him? So if he didn't spare him, but actually delivered him over for us all, then what should be your response to that? That's what Paul's saying here. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? What is coming to you in the future? Heaven and lots of great glorious things right perfect earth and righteousness uh, abounding and yeah we inherit the world according to chapter uh, four right mm -hmm. a new heaven a new earth where death will be abolished where god's enemies will be abolished where satan will be removed where evil will be removed the last two chapters of the book of revelation uh that's given as a gift. He who did not, if God didn't spare his own son, but handed him over, delivered him over for us all in death, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So if you go through loss of health, wealth, God forbid, I hope it doesn't happen in our country, but it's happened in a lot of countries around the world where Christians actually get thrown in prison because of a Marxist revolution or whatever, or because of Islamic authorities, Sharia law, whatever it might be. Even then, as we're going to see, that can't separate us. But when you're going through hard times, so many people judge their circumstances and judge that whether God loves them. Would you agree with that, Pam? Mm-hmm. When do we start to doubt God's love? 
in the hard times. So, up, oh, I saw his jerky again. I'll try and stay real still. I think several people are having trouble, but. Uh, I keep getting dropped, losing conne uh, connection. I don't think it's going to be on your all's end. I really don't. If a lot of people are having. Well, Catherine and my mom both say it's in and out and locking up at times. Yeah. We've really not had that problem. So we'll try and be really steady. And I don't think it's anything that I'm doing. So I think it must be uh, we'll have to call because we really haven't had this problem in quite a while since we've got a new router. But let's go back to that. If something great happens to you, something bad happens, don't judge those things. Those, those are subjective. We, we don't have a reading on that. What we do have is what we see here. If you have this down in your soul and in your mind, right? God's already demonstrated his own love for us. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, remember that? Once again, here's another great verse to put up. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. That's what I need to hang my hat on, stand upon. This is the ground that I need to claim as mine. Who will, does that make sense, verse 32? That's where I want to really focus on. When I start to doubt God's love, God, I don't know if you really love me because all this terrible stuff is happening. How do we know that's not, how do, how do we know that's not true, that thinking that we're just having? Because he didn't even spare his own son for yeah. us. What did God do to deliver you? Are you getting, even of our bodies, listen, all of our bodies, everybody's online. If, if Lord Jesus doesn't come back um, in our lifetime, what's going to happen? All of our bodies are going to break down. Right? I could get cancer this year. Who knows? Get hit by a car. Right? Who knows? Train. Whatever. Aneurysm. Stroke. Heart attack. There's a thousand different things. I don't look at those things and say, I don't think God loves me. Folks, let's just admit it tonight, everybody that's on here. Isn't that a temptation to all of us? And yet, we, we know we live in a fallen world. We know that the creation itself groans. I've got to put in my thinking, perish that thought. God loves me. He's already demonstrated that towards me. I, even if my body fails, I know where I'm headed. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I get to see the glory of Jesus. I get to enter into that eternal inheritance. One day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. That's what I've got to tell myself. Those things I know are true. Did Jesus die on my behalf and conquer death? Did he promise these things? That's what I have to stand upon. Not reading in to these circumstances. Any thoughts on that, Pammy? No, I agree. Just his, telling yourself his ways aren't our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. And he's concerned about conforming us to the image of his son, not just everything being just pie in the sky by and by all the time. So conforming us into the image of his son, and there could be a million other things, like we've said before, that we may not see in this life, right? How it fits together. I think heaven, that's what. That's why I look forward to heaven. Um, so you have to continue to preach yourself these, these truths. Now, who will bring a charge against God's elect? By the way, let's, get, let's go back up to verse 32. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? It's like the, the, some of you don't throw stones at me. God is liberal in his bountiful love and giving thanks to us. Oh yeah, he's just very liberal. He just hands stuff out all, handing stuff out. He's freely giving us, it says, all things. What you have, if, if people really knew the future that you're going to inherit, what are you going to inherit? All of these things that the Bible speaks about. It's been given to you as a gift by his grace. 
So he's called you to himself. He's delivered his son over for you. This is so is God a, a fatherly, loving, compassionate God who has done everything to bring us to himself? Then I've got to trust him through the hardships. And I think that's what Paul in this context, because if you remember, we started picking up sufferings in verse 18. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us. That starts this whole section. Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect and make it stick? So you're in a communist country. You're in a country that brings up false charges. False charges were brought up uh, with Paul. right? Thousands of other Christians throughout history, actually millions. Um, your family turns against you. Your, your business turns against you. Whatever it might be. Ultimately, if you're God's child, if you are, the, it says here, the elect, which is he's just been talking about, that what a comfort. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Here's Paul's answer. God is the one who justifies. Do you remember that justification is a courtroom term? God gives the verdict. Not guilty. My guilty. You're guilty. And we've already seen we're guilty before God, right? All of us are. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Chapter 3, verse 23. What does God do? He exchanges the perfect righteousness of Christ. Christ bears my sin. This is, this is 2 Corinthians 5.21 if you want to check it out. I get the life of Christ applied to my account. God declares me, what? Not guilty and I stand here with the righteousness of Christ. If God has done that, so who will bring a, a charge against God's elect? No one. Why? Because God's the one who justifies. What a great comfort. Who is the one who condemns? Well, if you just connect the previous verse, you, ought to, you, ought to, you should know the answer. The implied answer is what? God. Well, who's the one who condemns? <laughs> the implied answer is oh. no one. Why? So you're asking why? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. Why is it, remember, we start out in chapter 1, there is no, there, no condemnation. This is chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to stand before God condemned. Why? Is it because you've prayed enough? You've given enough, you've witnessed enough, you've read your Bible enough? Absolutely not. You don't look to yourself. If you, if you look to yourself, you're condemned. Are you not? Do you have perfect love? Do you have perfect righteousness? The, the answer is no. Have you loved God perfectly? No. Have you loved others perfectly? No. The answer to those things is absolutely not. If it was based on you, you would stand condemned. God hands Christ over to endure my condemnation. I get his righteousness. That is glorious truth. So therefore, he's answering his question. Who's the one who condemns? The implied answer is no one. Why? Christ Jesus is he who died. How can you be condemned if Christ is the one who died on your behalf? Yes, who is what? Raised. Raised. Is that it? Who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So look at everything that he's saying. Who's the one who condemns? Implied answer, no one. Why? Because Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, was raised. And who's at the right hand of God the Father? That's all over the Bible, right? All, we've been studying Hebrews. How many times does it come up in Hebrews? And he also what? intercedes he's going to bring you home if he's already accomplished all of these things that verse alone is another memory verse isn't it you know how many people a lot of counseling is because of 
people with guilty consciences over their past. Their, maybe their friends can't, you know, friends, family, whatever. Your own conscience, Satan, accuses you. Your own conscience accuses you. And you're like, I know I'm forgiven. I truly trust in Christ. I've repented. I recognize before God. Then, then how come you're not trusting it? Apply. What does, and sometimes I've just said, what do these verses say? Let me ask you, do you believe it? And this is, I don't like hearing this. I just can't what? Believe it. No, I can't forgive myself. Have you ever heard that? Myself. How many times have you heard somebody say that? A lot. Is there anything in the Bible about that? No. Except what, God, your sin is against God. Except what he has accomplished for you. How many people do you think just, just are burdened with a load of guilt? How many, how many on here know people who you believe a lot of their problems revolve around a ton of guilt? So I, I, think, it's, I think it's a problem. So applying these truths, really letting it sink in, if you ever start thinking about your, your life, have you really, as, as you look at your own witness and you look at your own uh, Bible reading and stuff like that, you don't look to yourself. Do you want to improve in your love for others, your love for your spouse and being a good worker? Of course. Of course. Look at it, though, as a life of gratitude instead of merit. Is there a big difference between merit and, and grace? Absolutely. And if Christ has merited for us, the, the, the automatic response is gratitude. Think about what kind of gratitude should well up in us just because of these verses we've looked at. Now, verse 35 and following. What can then separate us? Nothing. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? No one. And that should be the implied answer. Will tribulation? Waiting for an answer, right? <laughs> That's what Paul's doing here. Who will separate us from the love? Do you, do you see the interaction that Paul, all the way through this since verse 31, what shall we say to these things? Asking for you to interact with it, contemplate it, think about it, respond. Same way here. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? No one. Will tribulation? No. Will distress? No. Persecution? No. And I can't hear everybody tonight. Will famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. Nope. Sword? No. Nope. Could all those things happen in your life? Yes. Yes. So they can happen in your life, but what can't they do? How many of you get fearful sometime of the future? Of what could be, right? Any of our future. All of us at times have fears. Right? Mm -hmm. These Should these verses really help you? That, you know, even if those things happen, what? It's not going to separate me. That's the implied answers all the way. Who will separate from the love of Christ? No one or nothing. Just, look at verse 36. Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We're considered sheep to be slaughtered. Gee, thanks. <laughs> put that up as a memory verse, right? I haven't seen that one put up on mirrors or bumper stickers. Or, hey, here's, here's my favorite memory verse. I'm considered a sheep to be slaughtered. How could you turn that around to a positive statement, do you think? Because even that can't separate me. God may use me, even in a difficult situation, to bring him glory and be doing a million things that I don't even know he's doing. Should I, what should be my response? Man, through all this, it's not going to separate me. What do I have coming? Oh yeah, a glorified body. Oh yeah, a renovated earth. Oh yeah, the glory of Jesus. One day I'm going to be absent from the body and I just pray that it happens sooner than later. Right? That could be your mentality at times, right? Because you're because of the circumstance, and yet God may what? 
spare your life, bring you through it, keep trusting. It's kind of like that line Pam said that uh, the one verse that kept her on that right track was, where else do I go? Sometimes it's just verses like that that can keep you get staying on the right track. Because what's the option? Hopelessness. and What's that bitterness road like? If we go down the bitter road and we say, God, the hell with you, and we just get angry and mad at God and the world, how many of you know people that just are bitter people? They really are just bitter because of circumstances. And you can have somebody else that go through this, goes through the same circumstance and they don't have that same mentality. <laughs> if we find ourselves in that condition, what should we do? Seek help. Get a good, good counselor. Keep your nose in the Bible. Fight to get back on the right path. Right? Stay connected. Keep seeking God. You fight for joy because if we just throw up our hands and say, I'm just going to keep going down this road of bitterness, God, I will show you. What happens to us? We are miserable day after day. But if we say, God, I don't understand it. I remember you saying this. God, I don't understand it, but I'm going to walk with you basically is what, like you said, right? Mm -hmm. You ever do that? Just say, God, I'm getting on that, doing a U-turn, getting on that better path, even though I don't, I don't. Know where I'm headed fully, but I'm going to trust you each day. Do you ever pray this, God, give me enough grace for today? Mm -hmm. Do you see, Judy, she said, we are sheep of his hand. Yeah, out of, uh, is that Psalm 100, I know? 23rd Psalm is great. Um, I think it's Psalm 100, that uh, we're the sheep of his pasture. And we're, but Judy, what about the rest of that, Judy? Uh, we're the sheep of his hand. To be slaughtered. Yikes. What he tells us in these verses is even tribulation and persecution and famine and sword. None of that can separate us. Because look what he says in verse 37. In all of these things, what's what things? All the troubles. That we just mentioned. We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We can overwhelmingly conquer even though we go through all those things. That's, that's the amazing thing. Can you imagine just with that mindset, can anything, if we really did believe these verses and really hung on to them, I think it does make a difference. Don't you? Mm -hmm. And how we look at trials and hardships. Um, we can overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death that's ultimate, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. That's including you. Or what? Ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So go back to what he started with. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Which I think is what Judy was saying. Anything could happen. We could be slaughtered, but we're still a sheep. Yeah, absolutely. We're still... A, Jesus Here, Jesus doesn't lose any sheep, right? Mm -hmm. How many sheep does Jesus lose? None. He said, I don't lose any that the Father's given me. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that should really bring us comfort in the midst of life's most earth-shattering difficulties. I pray that none of us go through those things, but all of us know if we live long enough, we, we can go through things that really shake us, right? And we don't look at those things and read into that circumstance, God, you don't love me. What do we stand upon? What his truth says. He's already delivered his son up for me. To suffer in my stead to keep me from, what, eternal wrath. I mean, if he's predestined me to be conformed to the image of Jesus, he's justified me, and he's going to glorify me, and Jesus is interceding for me, 
then nothing can separate us. And then he, he lists all these things, these powerful things. Very are there super are, are there angelic dark powers? Do you believe in a in a, an evil dark world? I do. But none of these things, death, life, principalities, height, depth, cre any created thing, is able to separate you from what? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Catherine said her one of her favorite verses is Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Yeah, that's another good one. And and folks, that's what I would say. Read As you read through the Bible and you, you see verses like this or Job or Psalm, one of the Psalms, because um, you said a lot of the Psalms were very helpful. All of us are different at what might really grab us. But if you're like, that verse is like gold. That's like gold. Write it down. Memorize it. We can have faulty thinking, don't you think? We are... We can have wrong feelings and wrong judgments, and we think we know things like what, and we're like, those are subjective. My feelings can be wrong. I, I want to stand on what God's Word says. Because I see His people who loved Him could go through a lot of hardships, right? Mm -hmm. Job and Paul, I mean, Paul. I mean, think about all the stuff Paul went through. There's a man that I know, uh, Dick Shaw. He's the only human being that I've ever known who went through a lot and yet was a very gracious man at the end of his life. He wanted at his funeral, and it was sung, Great is thy faithfulness. If I told you his story, many of you have heard me tell it, or you've heard Dick Shaw tell it. He's with the Lord now. But lost his parents and a sister at sea. There's a book written about it. They were missionaries. Uh, sick in Africa during World War II. As they were coming home, their ship got hit by a German submarine, and the ship went down, and him and his sister were on a life raft with other people, small raft, no bigger than our table here, for like 20-some days, right? S him and his sister were separated later. Uh, a British boat picked him up. And uh, now, Dick will tell you that he did have... A, a little rough patch in his life, but the majority of his life, he lived a loving faith. He had a loving, faithful relationship with his Lord and Savior. And um, so, God, let's let's pray this tonight. God, be glorified in all my circumstances, and may I really trust in you, no matter what comes. That's a hard prayer to pray sometimes. Lord, whatever comes my way, I want to I want to have gratitude. Even when I don't understand what's going on, I want to trust in, in your promises. And hopefully bring it around to it. You know, when things are going well for us, we ought to really be like, really overwhelmed with gratitude, like all, how great our redemption really is. I wasn't looking for God, and yet God supernaturally drew me to himself. Right? Whether edge at age 8, 24, 68, whatever age it is. And that God is doing these things. Justifying us. So, anyway. Now, buckle your seatbelts. I'm so bad. Romans 9. So, can I, you want to tell them? You're, uh, next week, maybe, we'll get into it. Romans 9 was a tough chapter for Pammy. Mm -hmm. Struggled through it for a couple years. Mm -hmm. At least. Maybe you're struggling with some of the things we've, we've talked at, about, but you know what? Keep reading it and, and come, come to the point where you're like, is this what the Bible teaches? And I, So if you're, if you're on and you wrestle with some of this, just keep praying. And, and there can be, I can name... Pastors like R.C. Sproul and Piper who wrestled with them, and now these these truths became their their foundation for their ministries for their life. So these things can become a rock solid foundation. You mean the truths of chapter nine and chapter eight? And eight. Yeah, I because mean, we've already talked about predestination and mm -hmm. the issue of elect, and we're going to get into it, especially in chapter nine, right? Mm -hmm. So, friends, I hope all of us uh, as Big takeaway, be in awe 
of what God has accomplished. Allow that to create gratitude in how you look at life. So, that's my prayer. Any other thoughts tonight? I know I... Oh, it's yeah, getting late. Sorry about if the computer was... Uh, yeah, I think some people struggled. I think my mom might have gotten off. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. So we, we will contact our uh, internet service and make sure everything's okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your amazing love for us. That nothing can separate us from your love. You've done everything to bring us all the way home. So we just pray for ourselves and for others tonight that uh, whatever difficulty and hardship we go through, we're that we're so overwhelmed at what you've accomplished and are going to accomplish, that we, our hearts are warm with affection, worship, thankfulness for what you're doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week.